Hello, and welcome to the first session on my C++ Standard Template Library by Example webinar series. What we're going to be doing over the next uh, weeks or two, we'll be going through a number of examples of C++ STL code, and I'll be talking about the various C++ features that the Standard Template Library relies on, and we'll also be looking at lots of examples of the fascinating aspects of the C++ Standard Template Library. What I typically do in these sessions is I go ahead and start off by showing you where you can find the source code, and then we'll start looking through examples. There's a few assumptions built in here, most of which deal with the fact that I expect people have some familiarity with C++. So I'm not gonna be spending a lot of time doing very basic C++ features like what's a for loop or an if statement or even a class for that matter. But if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask them. What I typically do is I'll present some examples and then I'll go ahead and we will uh, walk through any questions that you have. So I'll typically do the questions after I present some of the code. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask them. All the lessons here will be recorded and posted to my YouTube playlist. So with that, let's go ahead and start. I will start by sharing my screen. Okay. So you can, if you go to my GitHub account at the uh, Douglas Craig Schmidt slash C++ uh, folder, you'll find all the code we're gonna be covering. The, there's a bunch of things here, some of which we'll cover now, some of which we'll cover later, but the main body of what we're gonna be looking at will be in the STL subfolder under my C++ directory. So that's where you can find all the code. And all the code should build and work out of the box if you've correctly installed uh, the Sea Lion interactive development environment for C++. Okay, let us go ahead now and I will share Sea Lion. So uh, some of the discussions we're gonna have will be conceptual. The bulk of what we'll be doing, of course, we'll be looking at code, but there will be a few things that will be uh, conceptual. And that's where we're gonna start here to begin with. So C++, as you probably know by now, is what's called a strongly typed language. And that means it can do type checking. This is helpful because it helps to resolve errors at compile time rather than run time or link time rather than run time. It also helps to make sure that the right amount of memory is allocated for the objects that are created and so on. But one of the downsides is what happens if you want to have operations that can be, work on many different types of data. Uh, languages like C that came before C++ didn't have good support for this capability. They didn't support overloading of methods or operators. They didn't support any way of parameterizing information. So as a result, people did kind of hacked up things like use hash defines. Another way to do this is to use basically void stars, which is another common technique of trying to futz around with the, the C style type system. Neither of these approaches are good for various reasons we'll talk about later. What we really wanna do is we wanna be able to take advantage of modern object-oriented features, in particular C++'s concept of parameterized types or templates. And so what you can do is you can basically use templates to parameterize functions and classes, and then you can parameterize them based on things like types or values or even other things like uh, methods and so on, functions. So that's what we're gonna talk about here. We're gonna talk about two different types of templates. One type of template is called a function template. And as the name implies, it works with functions, which are first class entities in C++. And the other type of element will be classes or template classes. And template classes are basically groups of member functions that work together to parameterize data types in a more or less a wholesale manner. For example, you could have a generic template for a stack where you could parameterize the type of elements in the stack. And you could have operations like push and pop and top defined on that stack. So the reason why we're gonna focus on these elements first is of course they are the essence of the C++ standard template library. And so if you understand function templates and class templates, everything else is gonna make a heck of a lot more sense. If you don't understand these concepts, then you'll be quickly lost. So I'm gonna cover this material today. We'll see how far we get. We'll pick up what we didn't cover today, tomorrow, and we're just gonna march through this material uh, piece by piece. So let's go ahead now and talk about something that's a bit more technical. And we're gonna start by taking a look at some examples that motivate the need for function templates. 
So here you can see a uh, simple class where we've got the way of doing this before we had templates. C++ has long supported the concept of function overloading or operator overloading, where you can have a function with a common name like plus or add, and then you can have different parameters. You could have plus for adding ints. You could have plus for adding longs. You could have plus for adding doubles. But the problem with this approach is it very quickly doesn't scale because you have to keep rewriting the same boilerplate logic again and again and again, which quickly becomes tedious and error prone. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to use the C++ template function mechanism, which I'm showing you here. And as you can see, instead of having to redefine these methods over and over again, we're going to define one method, which is going to be a method called add, and we're going to parameterize the types that add works with. So in this particular case, we're going to say template type name T, type name is just a placeholder for a type, and then we're gonna have two parameters, A and B of type T, and then it's gonna return an instance also of type T. So I think you'll agree with me that this piece of code here is much more concise and ultimately more reusable than having to repeatedly rewrite the code over and over again as we did up there. So let's go ahead and take a look at a simple example that will illustrate how this all works. So this is going to compare and contrast the use of non-template functions, just the plus functions we saw above. And then we're going to show how the C++ compiler and linker work together to synthesize the template functions. OK, so down here, we're going to see we have uh, int i, j, and k. We give some values to those. We have longs, l, m, and n and we have doubles A, B, and D. Now, we're gonna go ahead and just use the overloaded plus function to compute the results of adding those things. And if we run this program, you'll see that it, it gives the result that you would expect. So you can see that we're gonna get uh, 11, 15, and 16. That was the, the non-template version. Then let's go down here and see how we can use templates. So rather than having to rewrite those pieces of uh, functionality each time, instead, we're gonna use the add method and we're going to explicitly define the template types. So we're going to say add i and j as ints and return k, add l and m as longs and return n, add a and b as doubles and return d. And what happens under the hood is that the C++ compiler will go ahead and synthesize the implementations for add of int, add of long, and add of double. And in fact, in this particular case, it can actually inline the code. So this will be blazingly fast while still being strongly typed and obeying the other semantics that you'd expect with a function call. For example, evaluating the, the parameters at point of call. So if we go over here and we take a look at what happens when we ran this code, you can see we got the same results for using the template versions as well as the results for using the non-template versions. And that's a good thing. So that's a good example of how you can use templates effectively to do replacement of having to tediously rewrite the code. But it is a little bit more tedious at some level. We have to put the int long and double here, or maybe a better way to say it is we don't have to do this, but we did do it that way. So let's go ahead and take a look at another C++ feature called argument deduction, and we'll see how it's able to avoid needing to put in those extra parameters. So if you take a look here, you can see that this is essentially the same part of the code as before. We've got our add template, and the C Lion interactive development environment kind of hides unnecessary syntax. So when it knows it's a template, it can do a little bit of uh, cleanup on the, on the screen. But you can always just click on it. It'll go ahead and show you what's there. So if you take a look here, you'll see that we have adding of ints and longs. We could also easily do doubles. And what we've got is we've omitted the explicit type information. So we no longer have to put you know, int here. We can leave that out altogether. And the C++ compilers are smart enough to be able to deduce the arguments that are passed in this particular case. And of course, if we wanted to, we could also do something similar. Uh, we could say double D equal add 10.5 and 16.7. And you can see how we can just synthesize this literally on the fly and when we recompile this, then the compiler will go ahead and give the right result. So let's just add in the output operations here. You can see that we're using C++ IO streams, which is a way of being able to insert and extract 
data to and from sources of input and output. And so if we go ahead and run this code, let's go ahead and compile it. It'll have to recompile, so it takes a second to recompile everything. But then once it's done, we get back the results that we expect. So this ability to do argument deduction is very valuable and very helpful. Now, one thing to note is that with templates, especially the ones we've shown here, you can't mix and match types. So templates really want to have specific types. So you can see here, if we try to do add um, I and L, where I is an int and L is a long, this isn't going to work because the template up here is defined with a single parameter. If we wanted to make this work, we could fix it by saying type name u, and then we could come along and say u here, and um, this then gives us the ability to mix and match different types. There are pros and cons with doing this, of course, because you have to be careful that the types are gonna have the right precision to hold the data that they need, but it's an option, and we'll talk more about that later when we get a little further along. But for right now, let's keep it simple and just have a single parameter that we use for the template. Okay, so that illustrates how the uh, type, the argument deduction works with C++ templates. By the way, if you have any questions whatsoever, don't hesitate to click on the, the chat button and type your question in, and that shows up on my screen so I can tell someone has a question, and then that'll trigger me to go ahead and answer the question. Okay, so those are some very simple examples of using templates. These are function templates, of course. Let's continue on and we'll take a look at yet another example. And this example is going to be um, a little bit more interesting. And this is gonna show how you can actually templatize not only all the parameters passed to a function, but also the return value. So you can take full control over how the information is going to be provided. So as you can see in this particular case, we're going to uh, have a method a function called max, and max is going to take an A of type T and a B of type U, and it's going to see whether A is less than B, and if so, it's going to return B because we're looking for the max, otherwise it returns A. And we can also control the type of the return value, and this gives us very fine-grained control over the precision we need to do this. So uh, what we're going to do here is we're actually going to demonstrate how you can use this feature. And it's, it's kind of interesting because you can either provide all the parameters, as we do with this called a max here, where we have an int return and two character values. And we'll talk about how that works in a second. Or you can also just go ahead and provide the return type, which in this case would be double for this example. So in this case, we're telling it, hey, you need to use a double return type and then it can deduce that it's passing in doubles as the parameters. So you don't actually have to say something like this, double, double, toil and trouble. You can just say double and it'll deduce the other ones. The C++ compilers often can't deduce the return values, but that's where we can provide a hint to that. Now you'll notice that my interactive development environment, my C-line environment, highlighted this uh, double field here this double uh, type. And when I click on the little yellow lantern or yellow, I guess it's a, a light bulb, um, it tells me that I can go ahead and use an auto. And so if I put auto in here, this uses a feature that came into C++ about mm, maybe 10 years ago or so, came with the C++ 11 version of the standard. And it basically allows the compiler to deduce the variable type based on the calls or some other context information. So it's able to figure out that this is actually a double. So I don't have to type double. Those of you who are familiar with other languages like JavaScript and so on, and even Java nowadays, may be familiar with this concept because you can use things like var and val and so on to do much of the same thing. Sometimes type deduction is great. Sometimes type deduction is confusing. I'll use it appropriately as we go through the tutorials, but just keep in mind that that's there to Try to save on the amount of effort you have to do to type out, especially long types. Okay, so if we go ahead and compile and run this thing, then it should give us the results that we want. And you can see we get 5.5 and 98. And if we look back over here, you can see that 5.5, uh, of course, is the max of these parameters. But where the heck is 98 coming from? 
And 98 is coming from the fact that C++ will promote the character literals to integers. And B, I believe, has the value of 98 in the ASCII character sequence. We could also do some other stuff here. We could do something like this if we wanted to. See if we can make this do something sensible. So now when we compile and run this code, you can see we get B instead of 98. Uh, and that again is because B is higher in value than A, which comes one before it. So this is just illustrating how we can take control of these things. Now this particular example, uh, we don't actually have to put int here. Um, this is kind of interesting. So if you do this, then the compiler can figure out what you're actually trying to do. And you don't actually have to give the return type because you can deduce it through compiler magic. But uh, I'm just showing you that there's various ways of being able to take control over the parameters that you pass to the, to the functions that you're using. OK, so that's another example. Hopefully, that's pretty clear. Uh, again, this is fairly straightforward stuff. And I'm showing this to you because when we get into the more advanced features with the C++ standard template library, knowledge of this level of detail is going to make things a lot more straightforward to understand. So let's move on to the next example. And this should also be another function template example. And this is a fun one. So what this is going to show is that you can actually overload or what's called specialized template functions with non-templatized versions. And this is a very, very useful feature. C++ and the standard template library uses this very heavily to optimize certain types of data structures. For example, it can optimize things like copying character uh, arrays and so on. And so I'm going to show you here how the compiler will always give preference to the non-template version when given a choice between a template method or a template function with a given name and a non-template function with the same name and, and obviously the same number of parameters. And so uh, let's take a look at an example. Here's the example. We have function f, which as you can see is a, a template function. And the generic version says template. It, it could do something more interesting than that, but it just goes ahead and says template. And then we're also going to have an overloaded non-template function, which is also known as f. And this version is going to use the non-templatized variant of this. And the non-templatized version is just going to demonstrate how we can use template specialization and how the compiler gives preference to that when given a choice. Uh, again, it's not doing anything particularly interesting or uh, novel in this particular case. So this, is, this example is going to show how we can use template functions and non-template functions and how the compiler will choose amongst them. So you can see here, we're going to have uh, the function f, and we're going to pass in 1 and 2, and those look like ints. Then we have a call to f with the character literals a and b, and we're going to see how those are characters. And they are, uh, you'll be curious to see how that works in a second. And then finally, we also have a version where we have the value 1, which is a number, an integer, and then the character b. So that obviously raises lots of interesting questions. Which of these different functions are called by the compiler? Does it call this one? Does it call this one? How does it work? And I think the answers may surprise you. So let's go ahead and run this code. And you can see here the results say template, sorry, non-template, template, non-template. Non so keep that in mind. So it's non-template, template, non-template. Well, this one's pretty clear because that's an int. The, the two parameters are ints. And so it uses these values to take the non-template selection. The one down here indicates something very important with templates. When you use template methods, they don't do any automatic type promotion. In the previous example, we'd seen how C++ can promote types from characters to ints. But in this particular case, when you use templates, no type promotion is performed. So this is going to choose to synthesize a version of this template with cares as its parameter. And then finally, down here, you can see again, because there's no type promotion done with templates, this version selects the int variant of this f function. And it does the type promotion of the b character up to an int. 
So those are the values there. And this can be very important because sometimes you'll get some strange warnings or strange errors from your compiler and it says such and such a call is ambiguous. And often the reason is because you're forgetting that templates have to match exactly. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to another example. So now let's take a look at this one. And I think this might be our last template function example. So this one's going to uh, demonstrate a bunch of interesting things. This is going to show how you can either explicitly give the parameters, you can let the compiler figure out what to do. Uh, and it also is gonna show how you can overload template parameters. So if you come up here and we look in the include list, we'll see that there's a file called min. And if we go ahead and go into that file, you can see we have a couple of template functions to find here. So here's one called min that takes two parameters, p1 and p2, and it goes ahead and computes the min. Uh, notice how I, one way to do this is by using an if else statement. That's kind of the, uh, the most uh, overt way of doing things, but you could also use the so-called ternary operator. And the ternary operator is more concise and you can basically say uh, P1 less than P2, question mark, in which case it chooses P1, otherwise it chooses P2. So this is called the question mark colon operator or the ternary operator. And this particular operator is different from the if else operations above because the if else operation is a statement that does not explicitly yield a value. In this case, we have to return from the method, but the if else statement doesn't return a value, whereas the ternary operator is an expression, and so it does return a value. And your mileage may vary. I, I probably, if I was writing production code, would be more likely to use the ternary operator, but when you're first starting out, that can be a little bit daunting, so I, I didn't do it in this case. Here's another example where we're showing a three parameter version of min. This is just demonstrating that you can have parameter overloading on generic templates. And in this particular case, we pass three parameters in and you can see we use the two parameter version in the context of the three parameter version. So we check to see whether uh, the min of P1 and P2 is less than P3. And if it is, then we go ahead and we return the min of P1 and P2. Otherwise, we return P3. So that's just kind of demonstrating how you can mix and match between uh, overloaded parameters that are themselves templates. Then if you look down here, you can see that we go ahead and we use min of ints. We do min on doubles. Notice that we can't do this because again, the types have to match exactly and we didn't have a two parameter version of min. We had a one parameter, uh, one template parameter version of min. So that won't compile. And then down here, notice how I can basically put a little explicit cast here and say, yeah, I realize that, that 10 is an integer, but I want you to promote it to double. So this will tell the compiler, go ahead and promote this to a double. And then the final thing we do is we show the three parameter version of all these things. So we have min of three, six, and four. And of course, if we run the code here, then uh, it should give us the answers that we expect, which is good. Okay, so that I think is the final function template example. What we're gonna do now, and let me just double check this to make sure I'm not misleading you. Now we're gonna start talking about class templates. And we'll, we'll go through some of these. I'm not sure how many we'll get through today. Maybe we'll get through all of them. Maybe we won't, but uh, we'll go through some. So this particular example is, is really interesting. And this is going to show the use of class templates as opposed to simply uh, templates that work with functions. And it's also gonna demonstrate the difference between pass by value and pass by reference semantics for C++ parameters and return values. So we're gonna spend some time on this particular example because it's pretty cool. So the first thing let's do, let's go into the project and let's take a look at the files that we've got here. So we've got three files. We have main.cpp, which is what we're looking at here. And then we also have pair.h and something called type wrapper.h. And uh, we'll use type wrapper at various points throughout the course. And it's mostly there to show you what's going on under the hood with respect to how C++ handles things like 
passing parameters by value and so on. So here is the example we're going to look at. We're going to define a class, which will be a template class called pair. And there already is a class called pair as part of the standard template library. So I created a new namespace called my pair, and I stuck this template inside of the my pair namespace. The namespace is kind of like a package in Java. It's a way of being able to define a namespace where you can have classes or functions with the same names as classes or functions in other namespaces, and they don't collide with each other. It avoids what's called namespace collision. So let's take a look at the pair class. So the pair class is parameterized by one type key, and it's going to define two fields to what's called data members in C++. One field is called first, one field is called second. And it also defines a little method called max. And we'll come back and look at max later. Now, we're also going to illustrate some interesting things here about passing by value versus passing by reference. This is a very important concept to understand when you deal with C++, because C++, especially C++ STL, does a lot of things by value, but there's pros and cons to doing things by value. And one of the most obvious things is you end up with extra copies if you're not careful and you don't know how to use more advanced features in C++, like the move operation and um, I think it's R value references and so on. So let's take a look first at the version that's going to um, have pass by value set to this compile time parameter. So we're going to set pass by value to zero to start out with. What that means is we're going to use reference semantics. So you can see the constructor for pair takes two parameters of type const t ref. And what that means is that we don't actually pass the parameters by value, we pass references to the, to the parameters. We'll see how the parameters are used in a second. And then we go ahead and we store those parameters into the first and second data members. Okay, so that's what that one's gonna do. Now let's go over and look at the main program. So you're gonna see here that we're gonna have this thing called a type wrapper, which is gonna wrap int. And the reason we're gonna use a type wrapper is we wanna be able to see very specifically what's going on under the hood with respect to the constructors and assignment operators and destructors and so on that are called when we're manipulating this particular set of classes in the way that we're doing. So let's take a real quick look at type wrapper. Type wrapper is just a way to print out what's going on under the hood. So you can see we have a type wrapper constructor that just prints out it's the type wrapper constructor. We have another type wrapper constructor that takes a parameter of type T and it prints that out. We have one that takes a const ref, which is called the copy constructor. We have another one that's called the move constructor. We have an assignment operator. We have the basically the, the move assignment operator. And we've got operator less than. We've got something that will uh, basically return uh, an element. It's, a, it's called an implicit conversion. And then the final thing we have here is a destructor. And uh, we probably should make this be explicit for reasons we'll talk about later. So you can see that these things are, are basically doing, they're doing operations to convert stuff back and forth. In fact, I probably should print something here just to indicate that I was in the operator T method here. Okay, so this is just there to kind of get some print statements to show up. All right, so what we do is we then go ahead and make a pair now you can see it didn't like the explicit. Let me get rid of that. I knew that was going to get me into trouble. Get rid of explicit for this particular example. This example is just printing stuff out. We're not trying to make production code with this. Um, so we make ourselves a pair of type wrappers to int, and we're going to call this, uh, we're going to pass in p1 and p2. So you can see p1 and p2 are type wrappers to int. And then we go ahead and we print out the max of these values. And then we're going to do the same thing, except we're going to use doubles instead of ints. So up here, we had type wrapper to int. Down here, we do doubles. But otherwise, the code is identical. All right, so let's go ahead and run this. And I think we'll see some really interesting results. So before I do that, though, let me also show you the uh, pair implementation. So here's the pair implementation of max. So you can see max is going to see if first is less than second. And if it does, it returns second. Otherwise, it returns first. And you'll notice that we did not define max inline 
we defined this what's called out of line. And whenever you do out of line definitions of templates, you have to do a little bit of extra syntactic magic here to indicate that this max method is part of the pair template. And that's just some wacky syntax you'll have to remember. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. Let's go over here now and let's run the example. And you can see here that uh, this particular version, which is the one that's passing by reference, does some things under the hood. So you can see that we have a constructor called for type T, and then there's a copy constructor that's called when we do this inside of pair. So if you go back over here to pair, you can see that the copy constructor will be called here to initialize first and second. You can see that the constructor was called here to initialize P1 and P2. That's, that's what we're seeing with these arguments. Then you can see that we're also basically using this conversion operator to get the value that we want when we need to get an int. And um, then we've got a bunch of destructors that are called to clean everything up. That's the pass by reference semantic. Let's go over here now and change the settings to enable pass by value. So now we're going to do pass by value semantics. And I'll show you what the results are. And I think they're going to be pretty interesting to look at uh, when you see how they run. Assuming I can get this thing to run. Let's say, there we go. So when we do it with pass by value semantics, wow, look at how much more stuff gets generated. So we have lots more calls to copy constructors because whenever you pass something by value, the copy constructor is called. Whenever you return something by value, unless you're clever and use the value semantic features of C++, you have the copy constructor called. We use the assignment operator. So that simple piece of code, which we'll look at in a second, had a lot more stuff going on. There's more destructors called. There are more copy constructors called. There's assignment operators called. It's um, very, very complicated and obviously not what you want to do. Let's go back and take a look at the code just to see what it looks like. So here's the version that was passed by reference. That's what we looked at first, and that was very concise. And here's the version that does pass by value. So the pass by value version does not initialize first and second in the base member initialization section. Instead, it uses the assignment portion in the body of the pair constructor, and it also passes the parameters by value. And you can see that that generates a lot more stuff. Uh, so that's often why we want to pass things by const ref. There's alternative ways of dealing with this, and we'll talk about this later in the course, having to do with newer features added to C++ since C++ 11 that support, support so-called move semantics. And move semantics are somewhat steeped in mystery, so I will spend time later demystifying them for you. But right now, just kind of think about this in terms of the features that you um, need to know and love to be able to pass things efficiently. So it really does make a difference. So the, the thing to remember from this example, often you want to pass things by const ref, and you usually want to initialize data members in the base member initialization section, which is everything from the colon up to the opening curly brace. And what happens here is this is what's called initialization semantics. And if you don't do that, then instead, you'll have to get the default constructors called for first and second, followed by doing assignment semantics, which is usually way more overhead. So something that you should be aware of, and it's just good practice to get into in general, is to always make sure that you initialize your data members in a class in the base member initialization section. And if you follow that simple rule, your, your code will be more efficient and you'll have fewer surprises with things like uninitialized variables. Uh, let's see, I think, those were the main things I wanted to talk about in these examples. Uh, let's see, I think we have time probably for one more topic, and then we'll take a break and pick it up again tomorrow. So here is another example. And this particular example is going to demonstrate the use of a, another template class. This is a very common thing. We're going to define a class called a container, and uh, it's a template. It's templatized by type name T, so it can have arbitrary parameters passed to it. And this particular container 
is, is a very mindless container. <laughs> it's just going to have an element and it's going to take an argument, which is a const ref in this case, and it's gonna go ahead and assign the argument to the element. So it's using the base member initialization section, it's passing by reference, so it's got all those good properties. And then it's gonna have a single template member function, which is going to increase the element count by one. A very simple class, I think you'll agree. So when um, this particular example, this is what's called a template member function. So let's go ahead and take a look at another example. This is an interesting example. This is another example that has a, uh, it's similar to what we had before, but we're gonna do some extra things with it and show some other cool C++ magic. So we have a class called class A, and class A takes a parameter of type T star, so it's a pointer to T, and it's gonna go ahead and stash that away in a, a local data member in the class. And we define this to be explicit. That just means that it will do no type conversions on your behalf. It's a way of guarding against accidents that are hard to track down in the code. And you'll notice what we do in this constructor is we go ahead and we print out the name of the parameter as a type. So you'll get a chance to see what uh, C++ supports with respect to type inspection. It's not as, or introspection, it's not as powerful as the reflection capabilities you'd find in a language like Java, but it's still interesting. And, We'll see how that works in other cases later. So this is an example of a, a class that has a constructor, and it also has another template member function. So this particular one is going to do nothing more than just print out the name of the parameter that's passed to it. Now let's go look at some different things, and this is where we get into some newer features in C++. This is what's called a member function template, as opposed to a template member function. Seems like sort of a permutation of the name. And you'll notice in this case, we have class B that is not a template class. Up here, we had class A that was a template class. So down here, we have class B that is not a template class. However, we have a member function template in that class. And member function templates have certain restrictions. They cannot be virtual, and you can't therefore override them. So this will also go ahead and just print out the name of the type. And then finally, we have class C, which is a template class of type T that has a member function template of type U. So now we've got all the different permutations. Up here, we just had a template that, and it used the template in one of the template member functions. Down here, we had a non-templatized class that had a template type name, member function template. And then finally, we had class C, which is a template class that has a member function template and the two types are different. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this works. Here's the main program. We're gonna go ahead and define ourselves a container of int and we're gonna increment it by one so that should give a value of eight. We're then gonna go ahead and see how we could use the template member function for class A which we parameterized by long. And you can see we pass in the address of a long and then we call function F and pass in the address of a long. Down here, we show the use of a member function template as opposed to a template member function. And you can see here how what happens is the compiler actually synthesizes different versions of MF, one that works for pointers to ints and one that works for pointers to doubles. And then finally down here, we show yet another example of a template class and a member function template where we go ahead and make ourselves a class C instance that is parameterized by int, a class C instance that parameterized by double, and then we go ahead and call MF and uh, on C and on CC, passing in the address of I and the address of D. So when we run this code, it should do some interesting things. It'll give you an indication of what the type information looks like. So here you can see that we have the value eight, and then we have a bunch of type names. So pointer to L, pointer to long, PL. Uh, pointer to int, pi, pointer to double, pd, and so on and so forth. And so this is just illustrating how the type information is used. Uh, and in this case, we had an i as opposed to a pointer. In this case, we have a d, you know, we have a double as opposed to a pointer. So this is indicating how type ID and name work for C++'s interest, type introspection mechanism. These are rather advanced features, and you're not likely to stumble upon them right away. But when we get further into the the depths of 
C++ STL, you'll see that these types of mechanisms are used with C++ STL in order to do various cool things like template metaprogramming, which are ways to actually get your compiler and linker to do the bulk of your program uh, computation offline before the program actually runs. Okay, well, as you can see, we got through a bunch of elements today. Uh, we still have a whole bunch more things to go. Most of the rest of this stuff will be different variants of class templates. We'll talk about things like template templates. We'll talk about things like partial template specialization. We'll talk about variadic templates and so on, all of which are absolutely fascinating topics. Those will come later, though. We'll, we'll start talking about them tomorrow. So this is a kind of a good place to um, stop presenting. And let me go see if there's any questions. Ah, great questions. Is there any difference in template logic between classes versus structs? I love this question. So <laughs> this is one of those things where C++, when it was initially, originally devised, uh, had this motto of being as close to C, but no closer. And so initially, Initially, C++ was called C with classes, and that's the way it was defined at first. And what that meant was they added classes to C. Bjorn Strustrup and his team, Andy Koenig and Stan Lipman and uh, Jonathan Shapiro and so on at uh, at t Bell Labs at the time. I guess it was actually, yeah, it was at t Bell Labs initially. Uh, they were very interested in adding object-oriented language support to C. And this took place around 1980, so it's about 40 years ago. It's hard to believe it's been that long. and so. C, of course, has structs, but structs have no access control mechanisms. Everything's public in a struct, and you can't inherit structs in C very easily. So what they did with, with C++ it was called CFront. It was a front-end translator that took C++ code and generated the corresponding C code. They added a new feature, a new capability, a new type constructor, type creator, known as a class. And really, the only difference between a class and a struct is that in a struct, all the fields, all the data members and member functions are public by default, whereas in a class, all the data members and the uh, member functions are private by default. So that's really the only difference. Uh, you'll see the early versions of C++ STL use structs extensively, which I always thought was kind of a botch because structs tend to expose all the private parts, uh, all the things that should be hidden in a way that get, makes you too familiar with them. With later versions of STL, I think people have moved more towards using classes, which is much better. Uh, but really, there's no real difference in terms of the methods. It's just that in a class, everything is private by default. In a struct, everything is public by default. So those are the two primary differences between them. But that's a great question. So if there are no more questions, then we'll go ahead and wrap up for the day just to give you a sense of what I do. Uh, after this class is done, I will go ahead and render the video. We've been recording this video. So I render the video and then I go ahead and I upload it to my uh, YouTube playlist for C++ by example. And people can come back and watch it and comment on it and so on. So if there are any things that I talked about here that you were not really clear on, and didn't really know enough to ask the question, that's okay. You can go back and rewatch it again, and I'll uh, be happy to, to answer any questions that you post on my YouTube channel. We'll continue up tomorrow with our discussions of, of templates, primarily class templates. And then from there, we're gonna get into the much more interesting features of STL, which include things like containers, vectors, lists, decks. Those are all sequential containers. We'll also talk about various types of associative containers, there'll be ordered associative containers, things like sets and maps. We'll talk about unordered associative containers like unordered sets and unordered maps. We'll talk about iterators. We'll talk about all the gazillions of adapters that STL defines like iterator adapters and container adapters and function adapters. We'll talk about functors. There's a lot of really, really cool material that we'll be covering here. And uh, I'm also gonna try to weave in modern C++ 11, C++ 14 and so features where appropriate to show you things like uh, proper use of exception handling features that are now specified in the language like no except. We'll talk about how to write exception safe containers that are trivially strongly exception safe without having to do much beyond no a few little tricks with no except and swap 
We'll also spend some time talking about advanced features like move operations and move constructors and move uh, assignment operators and so on and so forth. So there'll be lots of interesting things to cover. Some of the examples we'll cover are very simple, like the ones we looked at today. Others will be much more interesting, really little programs in their own right. And so uh, all, all in all, I think you'll learn a lot. And also make sure that you take a look at the, the GitHub repository where all the code resides and feel free to, to clone it, take a look at it, play with it, whatever you'd like to do. If you have any things that you see that are mistakes or areas that require further clarification, don't hesitate to let me know and I'll be happy to fix those as well. So with that, thanks very much everybody for coming and I will look forward to seeing you tomorrow.